Please, if you would, open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6. Let's pray. Lord, it's such a privilege to be here amongst family. For we are brothers and sisters uh, because we have those who have given their lives to you, Lord. We share a common faith and we share a common citizenship, which is in heaven, Lord. And it's so cool to be here this morning and worshiping you together as one body. And Lord, now as we break open your word, I just pray that you'd speak to us from it, that you just fill our hearts and our lives with that burning desire to continue to surrender ourselves and conform ourselves more and more to your image. That work that you're doing in our hearts would just spill over onto others. And that would, we would uh, be your hands and feet, Lord, as you do a work here in, in Savannah and around the world. So this morning, just bless our time in your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we left off in Genesis chapter 6. We finished up with verse 8. Today we pick it up at verse 9. Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. It says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So last week we went through the generations from Adam all the way to Noah. And now the family of Noah is described in a little more detail. We're told that Jem, Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And it indicates also here that Noah was a righteous man. It's actually the first time the word righteous is used in the Bible. But Noah's righteousness is also mentioned in other places in the Bible. It's mentioned in Ezekiel 14.14 14, and verse 20 there as well. It's mentioned in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And Peter also mentions it in his second letter, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 5. Noah is mentioned frequently in the Bible. But his righteousness, as we all know, didn't come from his good works. His good works came from his righteousness. They came because of his righteousness. Like Abraham, his righteousness was God's gift in response to his personal faith. Both Abraham and Noah, I think we can say, believed God's word, believed the words that God spoke to them, and it was counted them for righteousness. Verse 9 also says that Noah was blameless. He was a blameless man. And so if righteous describes Noah's standing before God, his vertical relationship, then blameless describes his horizontal relationship, his conduct before people. He was righteous and he was blameless. Blameless doesn't mean sinless, because no one, as we know, but Jesus Christ ever lived a sinful, sinless life on earth. But this word actually means having integrity. He was whole. He was unblemished. And remember last week, Noah and his wife didn't have kids right off the bat. They waited just a bit. And so a quick half a millennium later, five quick centuries go by, and then he's got Shem and Ham and Japheth scampering around his house, getting in all sorts of mischief. Verse 11 reminds us now the earth was corrupt in God's sight. The earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. So now remember last week we read that God was not happy with how mankind had progressed since he had created them. We turn just Actually, on the same page, verse 6, we pick it up there. It says, The Lord actually regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I'm sorry that I've made them. But Noah 
found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Remember last week we talked about how that word favor can be also translated grace. Noah had found grace, or better, grace had found Noah. And so the Lord chose Noah to become the vehicle by which he would do an amazing work in the world. Not because he was somehow qualified, was he? God didn't look for the most skilled shipbuilder around. Because we don't even have any word that a ship had even been built at this point. He didn't look for the best zookeeper or the best ship captain to do his work. He chose Noah in a similar fashion that he chose David. If you turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 16, We did this in our home groups. We found in 1 Samuel chapter 16, God looks on the heart. He doesn't look on the outward appearance. 1 Samuel 16, verse 4, it says, Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons, invited them to the sacrifice. Verse 6, it says, When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. God had sent Samuel to anoint a new king. Verse 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. Man looks on the outward appearances. But the Lord, he looks on the heart. Jump down to verse 11. Then Sam, had they gone through all the sons, Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, Well, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he's, he's keeping the sheep. He's out in the back 40 keeping the sheep. Samuel said, Go get him. Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. And now he was ruddy, and he had beautiful eyes, and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, Anoint him, for this is he. Remember, we like to say God doesn't choose the qualified. He qualifies the chosen. And so we see with Noah. Verse 13, back in Genesis 6. God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. So God now reveals his plan to Noah. And we have all read this perhaps hundreds of times. We all know this story. And so it's easy for us to gloss over this, but I think it's important for us to put ourselves in Noah's sandals here for a minute. And put yourselves in, in Noah's place as he's hearing this for the first time. There's no record of a previous interaction between God and Noah. But what is recorded here is the following. This is what God says to Noah. I've determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So let's just pause there for a minute. The God of a universe, the God of the universe pays a visit to Noah and reveals that he's going to wipe out everything. And Noah now is digesting this bit of news. And then here comes the next statement. Imagine you're getting this message from the Lord. So I've just heard that God's going to wipe everything out. Okay. And now, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. Right. God likes to blow our minds, doesn't he? I'm sure he blew Noah's mind here. He does this throughout Scripture. Remember he tells Abraham and Sarah, Sarah who was barren, that you're going to have descendants beyond number, greater than the stars in the heavens and the sand that's on the shore. And then he saves the sons of Jacob through their brother, who they sold as a slave after they threw him in a ditch. 
And then Gideon, remember the story of Gideon? He wants them to go out and fight against the Midianites, and he is able to raise an army of 32,000 men, and God says, that ain't going to happen. He wants to thin the herd a little bit. He wants to blow Gideon's mind. He wants to show that it's going to be a victory of God, not of Gideon or the men. And so he thins the herd down to 300. And he tells Jonah, I want you to go prophesy to Nineveh. I want you to go warn them. And Jonah's not wor- interested in, in doing anything of the sort. And so he takes off. Jo- I think God blew Jonah's mind a little bit, didn't he? He allows Jonah to digest on what he was told to do while he was in the belly of a whale for three days. What about Paul? Think about blowing Paul's mind. He's on the road to Damascus just ripping and tearing. He can't wait to get his hands on more of these followers of the way. And Jesus gets his hands on Paul. Blows his mind. God loves to blow his, our minds and do his work in ways that we couldn't even imagine. And through people that we would never choose. And he does that so we and everyone around us can see that it was his work and not our work. And so God tells Noah that he's going to wipe out the earth. He's going to blot it out. And then he tells Noah exactly What Noah would expect to be told after receiving that news. He's going to wipe out the earth, so now I want you to build an ark. And not just any ark, but an ark of gopher wood with rooms. And then I want you to cover it inside and out with pitch. It's crazy. We actually don't know what kind of wood gopher wood. Gopher is actually the Hebrew word that was used. Its meaning is unclear, and and it's actually only used... That word gopher in this, it doesn't relate to the animal, gopher. But it's a type of wood that was obviously available around that area. It's only used in this one place in the Bible. And Noah is given here some clear information by the Lord. The earth and the flesh it contained was going to be destroyed. And Noah was to make an ark. So then we have to ask ourselves the question, what is an ark? If you dig into the Hebrew, an ark is a box. It's not a ship. It's a box or a chest. And that's how the Lord chooses to describe what he wants Noah to build. I want you to build me a box, a really, really big box. In fact, it's really a well-ventilated barge, if you will. This thing wasn't meant to be sailed or rowed anywhere. It was meant to be big, and it was meant to float, period. And modern naval architects have looked at the dimensions of this thing and the weight it was meant to hold, and guess what? It would float. The dimensions and everything included of it makes sense if you were going to construct something of this nature. Surprise. Even with all of those animals in there. So no surprise to us, but God designed this first cargo ship with the proper dimensions to bog, bob along the surface of the waters. And that's why God, the Lord provides very specific instructions as to the size and the shape of this ark. Here in verse 15 it says, this is how you're to make it. The length of the ark is to be 300 cubits, and its breadth or width is 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. And make a roof for the ark. Makes sense. And finish it to a cubit above. And set a door on the ark in its side. And make it with lower, second, and third decks. So the ark is roughly the shape of a shoebox. We just talked about shoeboxes. And it was plenty large enough. It's roughly the size of the Titanic. Just to give you an idea of how big this thing was. And it had a, a cubit wide opening. 18 inches or so, all the way around the top for ventilation. So this thing is roughly 450 feet long, a football field and a half, 75 feet wide and 45 feet high. It's big. And we find here it had three decks in it, 
three levels and one large door on the side and this 18 inches of windows all around the top to, to help ventilate and provide light. And these three decks were divided into compartments where these various animals would be kept and where Noah and his family would live. There's some experts that have actually calculated, with, given the volume inside this ark, it was actually large enough to hold about 125,000 animals. And again, I'm picturing the look on Noah's face as he's hearing all this. He's probably standing there holding a small shovel, a rake or something, having come in from the fields, and he was just given this news and the plans to build an ark that was one and a half football fields long, 75 feet high and 75 feet wide and 45 feet high. The Lord sometimes asks us to do things that from our fleshly perspective are just crazy. But if Noah had any doubts about all of this, they were quickly laid to rest. Verse 17. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh flesh in which is the breath of life under heavens. Everything that is on the earth shall die. So God now reveals he's going to bring about his judgment on the world. And I'm sure now Noah can do the math. The ark was going to be the means by which God would save him. God would bring him through the waters. And not only him. Verse 18 says, But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And here's the first use of the word covenant in the Bible. It's the Hebrew word bereath, which can be a treaty or an alliance between men, or a divine promise or ordinance with signs and pledges between God and man. It's a covenant. It's a contract. And God initiated this covenant with Noah and extended it to Noah's family. God chose Noah. And by extension, his family as those with whom he would enter into a covenant relationship. He could have just told Noah, go build the ark and get you and your family on it and get those animals in it before it starts raining. <clears throat> But God chooses this moment to introduce the whole covenant concept here. Because it's something that will play such a huge role in how he would deal with his people going forward. This word appears often in Scripture because the covenant concept is an important part of God's great plan of redemption. And here we're just seeing a shadow of it. Verse 19. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kinds and of the animals according to their kinds. Of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come into you to keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that the Lord did commanded him. So now God provides a little more detail as to why this ark had to be so large. Kind of a progressive revelation to Noah. Probably a good thing. He reveals it slowly. and He tells Noah to bring every sort of animal into the ark with them. So that, such that there will be a remnant to survive this flood. And notice what it says there in verse 20. It says that they would come to him. He wasn't going to have to go out there chasing down the cheetahs or those elusive three-toed sloths. The Lord would bring them to him. Two of everything. There would actually be more of the clean animals. We'll read more about that later. And he said to bring food for themselves and the animals. And after having all of this laid on this lap, Noah receives all of this information. What does he do? Verse 22 is kind of a complex verse. 
But most commentators agree that it says he did it. He did it. So when God speaks to him, Noah was in a place in his life in which he could hearly clear, hear clearly hear what the Lord wanted him to do. God provided this clear and direct guidance, and Noah obeyed. What kind of craziness is that? I mean, who does that? And from what I read in Scripture, God does this all the time. Think about someone who God used in the Bible, some other character in the Bible, or even in more modern times. And if you think about them, most likely there was a time in their lives in which God asked them to do something that defied logic from a fleshly standpoint. And those who stand out throughout history, those who come to mind as people whom God used, weren't necessarily people who had the most amazing talent. For what did Noah bring to the table here? What, what talents does, are listed here as far as what Noah would be able to do? Nothing. But he had the gift of saying yes. Psalm 119, verse 2, it says, Joyful are those who obey his laws and search for him with all their hearts. Joyful are those who obey His laws and search for Him with all their hearts. And in that Hall of Faith chapter in Hebrews chapter 11, where Noah is referenced in verse 6 and the first part of verse 7, it says, without faith it is impossible to please Him. Without faith it is impossible to please Him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists And that he rewards those who seek him. And verse 7 says, By faith then, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. Noah couldn't see the rains coming. But in faith, he began to construct an ark for the saving of his household. God asked Noah to do something that from every fleshly perspective defied logic. And imagine what his neighbors said. But he trusted God and he obeyed. God could use someone like that. He didn't need someone with some special talent or ability. God can supply all that. He just needs us to be at a point in our lives that we are just willing to submit to whatever He asks us to do. We were talking about this in our home group this past Thursday. I don't often use the term Christian anymore. Because the meaning seems to have been watered down these days. I have used a follower of Christ or a follower, because it seems to strip away a lot of that extraneous stuff. But what if we use the term a submitter? What if we use that term to describe who we were, to define us? Because I think if we were to ask someone, as we were talking to them, if they were a Christian, I think we would get many positive responses. Many would reply in the affirmative to that. How about a believer? I think a lot of folks would would go along with that too. When you say, are you a follower of Christ? I think that raises the bar somewhat. Because following actually requires one to follow, right? But if you really think about what Noah did here at the end of chapter 6, and what Jesus did as he obeyed his Father to the point of death on the cross, they followed but they followed to the point that it cost them something. Someone who submits to the will of God surrenders their rights, surrenders their own rights, and hands them fully over to the one they serve. Let me say it again. Someone who submits to God submits their own right, rights and hands them fully over to the one they serve. 
I mean, Judas followed Jesus, didn't he? But he didn't submit. And so if I were to ask myself the question, okay, you're a follower, but are you a submitter? Am I submitting all the areas of my life to the Lord so that He can use me? Is that a way in which I, should, I could define myself? How do I respond to that? But that should be the way I'm living, isn't it? Shouldn't it? Because of all that Christ has done for me, submitting to Him should be a no-brainer. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So I want to take this example from Noah here and apply it to my life. It's a great example to live life as a submitter, ready and willing to do the will of the Father who is in heaven. Chapter 7, verse 1. And the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household. For I've seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights. And every living thing that I have made, I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did that all the Lord had commanded him. So now the time had come. Noah had spent many years building this ark. We're not told exactly how many. Some estimate 55 to 70 years. It was a big backyard project. And God recognizes here Noah's faithfulness again. He did the right thing, God says. And Noah is told to not only bring two of each kind of animal here, but he's told to bring seven pairs of all clean animals. One pair of the unclean, seven pairs of the clean. What a clean animal was would strictly be defined later for Moses as it's recorded in Leviticus chapter 11. But God here is already making a distinction between Clean and unclean. And he obviously shares that with Noah. And remember at this point, the people of the earth are still vegetarians. It won't be until Genesis 9, after the flood, that God declares to Moses that he may eat the meat of the animals for food. But most importantly, what we take from this is after the flood is over, Moses will offer up to God a sacrifice of some of every clean animal to God. And it is when God smells that pleasing aroma from that sacrifice burning on the altar in Genesis 8, verse 21, that's when he declares that he will never curse the ground or strike down every living, living creature again. And so Noah gets all of these creatures in the ark. And the Lord gives him a seven-day warning. Get everything situated. Get it all ready. Can you imagine Noah sitting up there by the the one-cubit windows, just kind of hanging out, looking, looking out over the land, taking a break, and a mosquito lands on his arm, and he swats it, and he goes, oh. And he yells down to Shem to go get another mosquito. He had to really restrain himself at that point. Verse 6 says, Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters came upon the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Of clean animals and of animals that are not clean and of birds and of everything that creeps on the ground, two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah as God had commanded Noah. And after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. So everything is on the ark. And they're sure that the neighbors are just loving this. It hasn't started raining yet. Noah's been working on these things for decades. All these animals show up, and they're all piled in the ark. And they're just loving it. They're probably wearing them out. They can hear all the noise coming from this thing, and it's just sitting there in the middle of the land. But Noah's hanging in there. He's submitting and he's not swatting any bugs. And then it begins to rain. 
Verse 11, it says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth. And the windows of the heavens were opened, and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast according to its kind, and all the livestock according to their kinds, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, and every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two, of all flesh in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded them. And the Lord shut them in. So apparently Noah took the trouble to keep detailed records. He records the day and the month and the year that the rain started. And this wasn't just any little rainstorm. Look what it says. It says, the fountains of the great deep burst forth. All the water that was contained below ground was unleashed. And then it says the windows of the heavens were opened. All the moisture that was in that canopy over earth was now allowed to condense and come down. And on that same day, it says, the family of eight made the final journey up that ramp and into the ark. And who closed the door? God did. Verse 16 says, the Lord shut them in. Noah did not have to shut the door on anyone's salvation, David Guzik said. God did it. After the same pattern, it's never our job to disqualify people from salvation. We let God shut the door. God kept that door open until the last possible minute. But there came a time when the door had to shut. When the door is open, it's open. And when it's shut, it is shut. And we read in Revelation 3, 7, it says, Jesus is he who opens and no one shuts. And he shuts and no one opens. So this ark is a salvation. It was a type of salvation for Noah. Again, we're foreshadowing the work of Christ. It was an ark of salvation for Noah, but it was condemnation for the world. There was no second chances for those who did not heed the warning 120 years previously. Verse 17, it says, The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth. And the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth. And all mankind. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground. Man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. This was a flood. Some have postulated that this was just a local flood. It just flooded a little bit in that area. But that just doesn't make sense with what we read here, does it? What's also interesting is that throughout the world, there are ancient accounts of a global flood in in numerous cultures. And since all mankind came from Noah's sons, all mankind has a memory passed along of the flood. There are more than 200 cultures documented throughout the world that tell of a devastating flood. And the vast majority of these legends that have been passed along through the generations speak of a family which is saved along with animals of the earth, by getting on this boat and eventually coming to rest on a mountain. What we read here, this flood was judgment. This was God's judgment on a rebellious and evil generation. The flood's 
covered the mountains. And every creature that was on the land or in the air was not in the ark, that was not in the ark, was blotted out. Which raises a question. What about the fish? Did a bunch of fish come flopping up on the ark? Did Noah have a bunch of large aquariums with whale sharks and dolphins sloshing around? No, God just blotted out, it says, the animals that were on the earth and the birds of the air. Creatures of the sea were preserved, at least a remnant of them were preserved through this judgment as well. The Bible says this deluge, this deluge continued 40 days. And the waters prevailed on the earth for 150 days before they even began to recede. So only Noah and his family and the animals led him, led to, left to him were left, bobbing around on this 450-foot-long shoebox of grace. That's what it was. It was a 450-foot-long shoebox of grace. And we will close here this morning. And as I look back at these verses that we've read there's two things that strike me. Two things that stick out to me from this passage. The first is the obedience of Noah. How he surrendered his life and submitted every part of his life to the Lord to follow him no matter where it led and no matter what the cost. And the second thing is the grace of God. He waited patiently for this evil generation to turn to him. 120 years he waited for them to turn. And that picture of him closing that door of the ark is poignant for me. That is God's hand protecting those who said yes. Protecting them from the judgment that was coming. And again, this is just a foreshadowing. It's a foreshadowing of those hands of God's Son that were spread out on the cross to protect those who will say yes to Him and surrender to Him as Savior and Lord. For they too will be brought safely through judgment and given new life. For that is the kind of God that we serve. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this amazing passage where we read of your judgment, but we also see an amazing lesson. A lesson of a guy, just a regular guy who you chose and gave him a mission and he was obedient. And you equipped him to be an instrument through which you could provide salvation to him and his family and all the, the beasts of the earth and of the air. And it's a lesson of your grace. For you showed grace to those who said yes. And so, Lord, this morning as we all sit here in your presence my prayer is if there's anyone here who has not said yes and surrendered themselves to that grace I pray they do so now and submit and accept you as Lord and believe in the work that you did on the cross through your son Jesus Christ who shed his blood that we might escape judgment that we might be forgiven that we might be saved. That we would pass through the judgment that is coming and be able to live with you forever throughout eternity in paradise. And Lord, until that time, I pray that you would make us a people who are submitters. We would take every aspect of our lives and submit them to you. 
to just say yes to whatever it is you ask us to do and be ready and willing to do it. To accept your grace. To say yes to the offer of love that you've given us and then to shine that love on others. as you give us our individual missions and our, and our missions as a fellowship. So, Lord, thank you so much for the work that you've done. Thank you for your word. And thank you for the gift of worship that we share. And, Lord, I pray that you just continue to do a work amongst us as we celebrate you and live for that day when we'll see you face to face and hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen.